This is the fifth day of this June 2023 seven day Sashin. And yesterday we finished reading from Zen Master Banke's public talk given at Ryo Monji, one of two talks that were translated by Norman Waddell in the book, The Unborn, The Life and Teachings of Zen Master Banke. This book also includes dialogues, questions that Banke responded to, raised by various participants in the training periods that he conducted at the temple. So today we're going to dig into those, and since we can't cover all of them, I'm going to skip around in an attempt to cover an array of uh, different, different people and different types of questions. The first question comes from a monk. This monk said to Banke, I was born with a short temper. It's always flaring up. My master has remonstrated me time and again, but that hasn't done any good. I know I should do something about it. But as I was born with a bad temper, I'm, I'm unable to rid myself of it no matter how hard I try. Is there anything I can do to correct it? This time, I'm hoping that with your teaching, I'll be able to cure myself. Then when I go back home, I'll be able to face my master again and of course, I will benefit by it for the rest of my life. Please tell me what to do. We can all relate to the feeling of being stuck in our habits. Whether it's a tendency to indulge in anger, which can manifest in thought, speech, and action, or some other default mode, such as dwelling in self-pity or blaming others for our problems. And Banke responds to this monk by saying, that's an interesting inheritance you have. Is your temper here now? Bring it out. I'll cure it for you. Of course, Banke knows there's nothing that needs to be cured. And then the monk answers, I'm not angry now. My temper comes on unexpectedly when something provokes me. And then Banke says, you weren't born with it then. You create it yourself when some pretext or other happens to appear. Where would your temper be at such times if you didn't cause it? You work yourself into a temper because of your partiality for yourself. Opposing others in order to have your own way. Then you unjustly accuse your parents of having burdened you with a short temper. What an extremely unfilial son you are. <laughs> and calling him a an unfilial son is actually quite a, quite a dig in the cultural context of Confucianism, uh, which was a major social, social force in Japan at that time. 
and it, it, it included filial piety, respecting one's parents and elders, bringing a good name to the household. Of course, indulging in anger uh, is one of the three poisons, along with greed and delusion. It clouds the mind, it creates separation, and it could have different dimensions, different layers to it. Anger can be driven by a need for self-protection, seeing other people as a threat of some kind, perhaps to one's self-esteem, such that it can also be related to feelings of pride, self-importance. And it can be a response to something we see as unjust, unfair, inappropriate, an affront to how we think the world should be. At the root of it is fear. Fear of not being in control. It's not that anger is never warranted. Sometimes it is. But even then, whether or not it's productive depends on how it's expressed. There's a difference between having the presence of mind to communicate what one is feeling from a calm center instead of, say, lashing out, getting defensive or uh, passive aggressive. But in responding to this short tempered monk, as the monk himself described himself, Banke frames the anger as a matter of clinging to preferences a reactionary response when things don't go the way he wants them to, which is related to the desire to be in control. I'm guessing we've all experienced this ourselves, either in our, looking at our own reactions or in the people around us. An example might be in the workplace. Let's say your boss assigns you a project with specific instructions on how to carry it out. And of course, being in a management role, the boss bears the responsibility for the project's success. And so their instructions are intended to achieve it. But you decide that you know a better way. And so you go ahead and you do it your way. It's clearly the right way, after all, you tell yourself. You might even resent being, being given any instruction at all. And this can create quite a bit of friction in, in our workplace relationships. And in, in this example, we can see Maybe this, this employee uh, is indulging in pride. And this kind of interplay 
happens in all different contexts, family dynamics, marriages, among friends, And in the, tra in the training program at the Zen Center, which is like a family. But what happens if you just let go of that pride and just follow the instructions? What happens then? What do you have to lose? All is resolved in the unborn. We don't have to live our lives this way, creating unnecessary conflict and suffering for ourselves and for others. It does poison the mind. But Zen practice equips us to see into it. And then Banke says to this monk that his anger is of his own making. He says, it's foolish to think that your temper is inherent. When you don't produce your temper, where is it? All illusions are the same. As long as you don't produce them, they cease to exist. That's what everyone fails to realize. There you are, creating from your own selfish desires and deluded mental habits something that isn't inherent, but thinking that it is. You create your outbursts of temper when the organs of your six senses, that is uh, vision, hearing, smell, taste, touch, and mind. You create your outbursts of temper when the organs of your six senses are stimulated by some external condition and incite you to oppose other people because you desire to assert your own preciously held ideas. When you have no attachment to self, there are no illusions. Have that perfectly clear. When you have no attachment to self, there are no illusions. No, I'm this, you're that. Instead, just this. Banke goes on, he says to this monk, but also th this dialogue is sort of happening in this open setting so other people are listening in. He says, you should all listen to my words as if you were newly born this very day. If something's on your mind, if you have any preconception, you can't really take in what I say, but if you listen as if you were a newborn child, a newborn child, it'll be like hearing me for the first time. Since then, there's nothing in your mind. You can take it in. You can't take it in, grasp it, even, even a single word. you'll fully realize the Buddha's Dharma.
practice as if you were a newborn baby. A newborn has no preconceptions, no expectations, no assumptions, no mental filter to imagine the future, no past, even, even no present. Uh, there's no concepts at all, nothing abstract. No sense of good or bad or should or shouldn't. No words or language. Just smelling, tasting, hearing, seeing, feeling. wide open. In the Blue Cliff record, there's a, a koan called Joshu's Newborn Baby. It's case number 80. And it goes like this. A monk asked Joshu, does a newborn possess the six senses or not? Joshu said, it is like a ball bobbing along on swift flowing water. A ball bobbing along on swift flowing water. And Joshu's response must have struck a chord because later the monk went to another master named Tosu and asked him, what is the meaning of a ball bobbing along on swift flowing water? And Tosu said, moment by moment, it flows on without stopping. Moment by moment, it flows on without stopping. Our true nature is the essence of life, of being in a body, a body that bobs along. It's not static. It's constantly changing from one moment to the next. We know this because we see how conditions constantly change. Everything we experience passes. And in the midst of all that change, including when it's chaotic or turbulent, that's our true nature. It never goes away. It's that which lies beneath, beneath our thoughts, beneath that turbulence of the thinking mind. And it's like a newborn experiencing the world. Bright. new eyes. (laughs) 
Then there's another question on the, the subject of anger, and it's asked by a farmer. The farmer says, Since I was born with a short temper, angry thoughts come into my mind very easily. This distracts me from my work. I find it extremely difficult to remain in the unborn. What can I do so that my mind will be in harmony with the unborn mind? And then Banke replies, Since the unborn Buddha mind is something you and everyone else are born with, there's no way you can go about attaining it now for the first time. Just attend to your farm work and don't engage with other thoughts. That's the working of the unborn mind. You can swing your hoe while you're angry too, for that matter. But in that case, since anger is an evil that links you to hell, your work becomes hard and onerous. In other words, anger poisons the clarity of our mind. And then Banke says, when you hoe with a mind unclouded by anger and other such things, the work is easy and pleasant. It's the practice of the Buddha mind itself. So it's unborn and undying. So when, when we are one with whatever we're doing, Everything flows with ease. No resistance, no hesitation. Just giving ourselves completely to the task. No matter how easy or challenging it may be, bobbing along. The next exchange is about working with sticky thoughts. A layman asks, Every time I clear a thought from my mind, another appears right away. Well, that's never happened to me. <laughs> Every time I clear a thought from my mind, another appears right away. Thoughts keep appearing like that without end. What can I do about them? This is a trap. One that I fell into for years. Thinking that you have to get rid of your thoughts. It's not just beginners who struggle with this, so do more experienced practitioners. We're aware of all the thoughts traveling through our mind because of the sitting that we're doing. And if we make the thoughts into a thing, into an object, a problem, we get frustrated and we convince ourselves that we have to eliminate them. But that's a form of aversion. We don't need to reject our thoughts any more than we need to reject having brown eyes or straight, straight hair. Let them be. And 
And then Banke continues. He says, clearing thoughts from the mind as they arise is like washing away blood in blood. You may succeed in washing away the original blood, but you're still polluted by the blood you washed in. No matter how long you keep washing, the blood stains never disappear. Since you don't know that your mind is originally unborn and undying and free of illusion, you think that your thoughts really exist. So you transmigrate in the wheel of existence. You have to realize that your thoughts are ephemeral and unreal. And without either clutching at them or rejecting them, just let them come and go of themselves. If we're actively trying to rid our mind of thoughts, our attention's not on our practice. We need to keep it simple. Just return to the practice, return to Mu. Who? This. It. Whatever you're working on. The moment we notice we've drifted off, Turn the mind back, right then and there. You know, if you're driving a car and it's a two lane road and you notice that your car is drifting into the oncoming lane. You've crossed the yellow painted line down the middle of the road. If you notice that, what do you do? You just turn the wheel. You just make the adjustment. Just that. You don't think, oh, huh, if I keep driving this way, I might get hit by oncoming traffic. Hmm, you know, maybe I better turn the wheel. No, you just do it. You notice, and you make the correction. No complications. The next question is about the purpose of practice. A monk asks, you're always teaching people that they should live in the unborn. To me, that seems like telling them to live purposelessly, without any aim. So it kind of sounds like this monk may be thinking that practice has no purpose, no use in, in, in the real world. As if upon experiencing our true self, which is no self, our mind becomes blank detached, unresponsive to life. So for him, awakening is a concept, an idea he has in his head, and that's the vantage point from which he's judging it because he hasn't experienced it. He's locked in dualistic thinking about enlightened and unenlightened.
not realizing that the more our awareness grows through Zazen, the more responsive we are to others and to life. And so Banke replies, you call dwelling in the unborn Buddha mind being without purpose? You don't stay in the unborn Buddha mind yourself. Instead, you're always working enthusiastically at other things, doing this, doing that, spending all your time making your Buddha mind into something else. What could be more purposeless than that? It's true when our mind is, is divided because we've latched onto thoughts. That right there is purposelessness and pain. Our true nature is not a bunch of concepts and ideas. It's not an identity that's defined by any labels, traits, names, words we can assign to it. There's that famous line by Dogen. You think that your mind is thoughts and concepts, but it is really trees and grasses and pebbles and tiles. It's also birds. The hum of traffic in the distance. Teacups and spoons. Toothbrushes. Socks. Another monk came forth with a similar question. This monk says, you tell people to dwell in the unborn, but it seems to me that would mean remaining totally indifferent to things. Banke said, while you face me there listening innocently to what I say, Suppose someone should come up behind you and touch a firebrand to your back. Would it feel hot? And a, a firebrand uh, is some kind of poker, perhaps uh, made of wood or metal that you stick into a fire. So if I put a firebrand, fire. <clears throat> If, if I put a fire brand to your back, would it feel hot? The monk says, of course it would. And then Banke says, in that case, you aren't indifferent. How could someone who feels heat be indifferent? You feel it because you aren't indifferent. You have no difficulty telling what is hot and what is cold without having to give rise to a thought to make such a distinction. The very fact that you ask that question about being indifferent or not shows that you're not indifferent. So you see, the Buddha mind with its illuminating wisdom is capable of discriminating things with a miraculous efficiency. It's anything but indifferent. How could any human being who is able to think be indifferent? A person who is really indifferent wouldn't be engaged in thinking. I can assure you that you are not indifferent 
and that you never have been. <clears throat> we don't need to deny who we are, nor try to become someone or something else. Why, why, why try to reject or become anyone other than who we are? If we stub our toe, we feel pain. Ouch! Ah! Just that. We don't need the drama of, oh, so clumsy, or, you know, why me? Everything we do, all, all the sensations that we experience, wherever we are, that's our true nature. We're it. Breathing, walking, sleeping, eating. How could we be indifferent to life? The next question comes from a laywoman who had traveled from afar to, want to uh, go to one of Banke's retreats. And have it, having heard of him and his teaching, she asks, according to what you say, all we have to do is simply remain effortlessly in the Buddha mind. Don't you think that teaching is too lightweight Now, now, we don't know if she's trying to challenge him or if she's just asking an innocent question. But the practice is very simple. Just relax and keep your attention on your practice. It's that simple. And yet we convince ourselves that, that there's got to be more to it. There's something we're not doing right. We need to exert ourselves, work harder, push harder. For what? And in responding to her question about the teaching being too lightweight, Banke says, Lightweight? You, you give vent to selfish desires and change it into a hungry ghost or do something foolish and convert it into an animal. You deludedly turn the Buddha mind into all sorts of different things. That's lightweight, not my teaching. So he's telling her that she's grasping. She try, she's trying to get something or somewhere. Thinking that it has to be hard and painful. And this is something many people struggle with in Sashin. The Buddha taught the middle way. We're not helping ourselves or anyone by getting all tense and wound up, feeling like we gotta make something happen. It doesn't matter how many days have gone by, where we are in Sashin. Everything always comes down to just this one moment, committing to it, just this one. Banke then says, nothing is of more gravity and nothing more praiseworthy than living in the Buddha mind. 
So you may think when I tell you to live in the Buddha mind that it's lightweight, but believe me, it's just because it has such weight that you are unable to do it. In other words, your, your thoughts are holding you down. This might give you the idea that living in the Buddha mind is a very difficult business, but it isn't true. It isn't true that if you listen carefully to my teaching, simply and easily, without doing any hard work, you are living Buddha this very day. Or we can say this very moment. Thoughts are not an obstacle. They're not a thing an, or an object that's in our way. They're not an enemy that we have to take down. There's an old Zen story about the pitfall of overexertion. And it comes from the book, Stories of the Spirit, Stories of the Heart, compiled by Jack Cornfield. And this is the story. One of the devotees of a temple was well known for his zealousness and effort. Day and night, he would sit in meditation not stopping even to eat or sleep. As time passed, he grew thinner and more exhausted. The master of the temple advised him to slow down, to take more care of himself, but the devotee refused to heed his advice. Why are you rushing so? What is your hurry? asked the master. I'm after enlightenment, said the devotee. There's no time to waste. The master then asked, And how do you know that enlightenment is running on before you so that you have to rush after it. Perhaps it is behind you, and all you need to encounter it is to stand still. Stand still. Walk still, sit still. Everything you need is right here. Everything is resolved. We'll end here and recite the four vows.